Good day, everyone. Welcome to the Grade 12 Life Sciences. This is STEM Digital School. Today, we'll be doing our prelim preparations. And the first topic that we'll be looking at is DNA, the code of life. And so this is under knowledge strand one, which is life at the molecular, cellular, and tissue level. And for your paper, or rather during the trial examination or your prelim paper, DNA, the code of life, will be 37 marks. And the other marks will be contributed by meiosis, genetics, and inheritance, as well as evolution through natural selection. Very much important to note um, the level or orders of the questions. 40% uh, of the paper will be with regards to knowing sign. 25% of the paper will be questions with regards to understanding science, then 20% will be applying scientific knowledge, then 15% will be uh, with regards to evaluating, analyzing, as well as synthesizing. And so just um, a few study tips for everyone. Uh, just time management is very imperative. And guys, if you do need help or if there are chapters that you do not understand, do not hesitate to ask for help. Again, practice makes perfect. So repeat your work, revise and recap as much as you can. Get enough exercise, eat a healthy diet and drink plenty of water. And most importantly, do not panic. Right, so the summary of today's presentation, we'll be looking at the brief structure of the cell. We'll also be looking at the structure of nucleic acids. We'll be looking at DNA, DNA replication, DNA fingerprinting, which is also called DNA profiling, and we'll also be looking at RNA. Yes, I think we can get into it. So what we already know or the knowledge that we came with in grade 12 is that all living organisms are made up of cells. So this includes our plants, animals, bacteria, as well as fungi. We know that a group of cells gives us tissues, a group of tissues gives us organs, and a group of organs gives us organ systems. So we can just simply say that Cells are the basic unit of life, okay? Then another thing is that cells have different compartments as well as function. And just on the picture there, we can see the different compartments, which um, namely we can see the vacuole, we can see the cell membrane, we can see the nucleus, which has the nucleolus, we can see the nuclear membrane, which is indicated there, and we also have um, DNA material, okay? And then we also have the cytoplasm as well as the mitochondria. Okay, another thing is that the cell has different types of organic compounds, which leads us rather to this wonderful question here, which says, name two functions of the nucleus. So we should be able to name the functions of the nucleus and they are as follows. Firstly, it controls all activities of the cell. And this is because the DNA which is found in the nucleus is responsible for the formation of proteins, right? So remember hormones and enzymes are proteins in nature and they control the metabolic reactions that take place in the cell. And then our second function of the nucleus would be that it transmits hereditary characteristics from the parent to the offspring. Okay. Right. So now we can look at nucleic acids. So nucleic acids, they are organic compounds that contain the elements carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, as well as phosphorus. Okay, and we find two types of nucleic acid. And the first type is our deoxyribonucleic acid. The second type is the ribonucleic acid. And the deoxyribonucleic acid, we in short call it DNA. And then the ribonucleic acid, in short, we call it RNA. 
Okay, so now we're just gonna firstly focus on the DNA. So now let's look at the structure of these nucleic acids, and now it will also be in regard to the DNA. Okay, so each nucleotide is made up of three parts. Mainly, um, it is the phosphate, sugar, as well as the nitrogen base. And just on the picture here, we can see that the phosphate is represented by this circle right there. And then our sugar, which is a pentose sugar, is represented there by this color purple. Then we have our nitrogenous base, which is represented by the green rectangle right there. Okay, so um, another important thing to note here, this is just a basic structure of nucleic acid. So it differs. If it's in DNA, the pentose sugar would be deoxyribose. But then if it's an RNA molecule, then the pentose sugar will be a ribose sugar. Okay, so again, another important thing, you should be able to label this diagram. So with labeling comes a skill of identifying certain parts of the diagram. So you should be able to identify that this is a phosphate group, that this is a pentose sugar, which is either your deoxyribose or your ribose sugar, and that um, this part here would be our nitrogenous base. Okay. Now let us look at DNA. Remember we say DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. Okay, so we have different types of DNA. There are three types. We have nuclear DNA, we have mitochondrial DNA, and we also have chloroplastic DNA. And mitochondrial DNA as well as chloroplastic DNA are what we call extra nuclear DNA. So remember now, when you speak of a nuclear DNA, we, it means that it is found in the nucleus. And when you speak about extra nuclear DNA, it is found outside of the nucleus. Okay. Now let's get into the location of DNA in the cell. And that is also just partly of what I have just said right now. So DNA is found in the form of chromosomes in the nucleus of eukaryotic cells. Very much important to note that it is in the nucleus of eukaryotic cells. Remember, prokaryotic cells do not have a defined nucleus. Okay? Then chromosomes carry the hereditary information in the form of genes. Chromosomes appear as tangled strings in the nucleus, and this is what we call the chromatin network. And here we just have a picture where we can see our chromatin network in the nucleus. So it's just um, this tangly long strings that are here in this circle there. And here we have a picture of a chromosome. So, so chromosome has two chromatids, which are connected by a centromere. Right? So we have our first chromatid right there, and the other one is there, and our centromere is right there in the middle. Okay, so DNA is found within the nucleus, and that is what we call the nuclear DNA. Then the DNA found outside of the nucleus is called extra nuclear DNA, and that would be our mitochondrial DNA as well as our chloroplastic DNA. And then question, of the following list of molecules, which combination represents components of a nucleotide? So we have, yeah, number one is sugar, number two is a phosphate, number three is a nitrogenous base, number four is amino acid. And the options that we have here, option A says is it one, two, and four only. Option B says, is it one, two, or three only? Option C, is it one, two, three, and four? And option D says, is it two, three, and four? Okay, so guys, just also note, multiple choice questions are part of your trial exams, and they usually um, are 20 marks, meaning that it is two marks for each question. So these are very important to take note and also just Take your time when answering such questions. 
eliminate the things that are not um, familiar or rather that are not in connection with the question. So now this question is asking for a combination of the components of a nucleotide. We know that a nucleotide has a phosphate group, it has a sugar, and it has a nitrogenous base. So amino acid is out of the picture. Therefore, we are looking at number one, number two, as well as number three. And that gives us with answer B. All right. Then next question. Type of DNA that only occurs in the nucleus is called, is it A, extra nuclear DNA? B, non-coding DNA, C, nuclear DNA, or D, coding DNA, All right? So now we're talking about the location of DNA. And guys, just a simple way to remember this, nucleus, nuclear DNA, they sound alike, and it would most probably be the nuclear DNA, and our answer would be C. Right, so extra nuclear DNA, remember that would refer to our mitochondrial DNA as well as our um, chloroplastic DNA. The non coding DNA, that's just another story, and we'll be looking at it later on in the lesson. Nuclear DNA is definitely DNA which is um, found in the nucleus, and coding DNA, we'll also look at it throughout the lesson. We're going to cover coding DNA um, throughout the lesson. Then we're moving on to the structure of DNA. Okay, so DNA is like a double-stranded molecule that twists into a double helix. Very much important that you should note that DNA is a double-stranded molecule which twists into a double helix. Okay, so always mention if you're asked for the definition of DNA that it is a double-stranded molecule which twists into a double helix. And here we have the molecule, which is twisted into the double helix structure. Then another thing with regards to the structure of DNA is that it is made up of monomers called nucleotides. So you guys just remember from um, what we have already learned about nucleic acid, we looked at the basic structure of a nucleic acid. And we also said that it represents the nucleotide. So when we have a phosphate, when we have a sugar, and when we have a nitrogenous base, that those three components are called nucleotides. Okay, so DNA is made up of nucleotides, so it's a number of nucleotides. It says the monomer, meaning that a DNA molecule is a polynucleotide molecule because it has various monomers of nucleotides joined together. Okay, so the sugar molecule is called deoxyribose. So remember, um, the pentose, we have a pentose sugar in our nucleic acids, but in terms of DNA, the sugar would be the deoxyribose. So those are just also one of the differences between our DNA as well as the RNA. Then we have two groups of nitrogen bases. The first one would be our purines, which would be the adenine and guanine. And we also have pyrimidines, which is the cytosine and thymine. Okay, so the purines is adenine and guanine, and pyrimidine is cytosine and thymine. And this is with regards to DNA. So these are the types of nitrogen bases, but they are grouped into two groups, which are purines as well as pyrimidines. Okay. So the nitrogen bases are held together by special bonds, which we call the weak hydrogen bonds. So it's very important to also note that they are weak hydrogen bonds because usually in chemistry, um, hydrogen bonds are very strong bonds. But when we get to biology, then it is weak hydrogen bonds. Okay, so adenine always pairs with thymine. As you would note that adenine is a purine and thymine is a pyrimidine. And then guanine will always pair with cytosine. Okay, and guanine is a purine and then cytosine is a pyrimidine. 
seven if we just check there we usually call these base pairs that they are complementary base pairs okay so then here we just have a key which shows us that the structure here stands for thymine that structure there stands for adenine and then here we have cytosine and we also have guanine okay so if we can also just look closely to this um double helix structure of DNA, we will note that this part there is adenine, and we also have a thiamine there, and they have bonded together. And if you guys also just look closely, closely, you can see two dotted lines. So there's one line there and another line there. So meaning that that is the weak hydrogen bonds that are holding together the adenine as well as the thiamine. And between the adenine and thiamine, we find two hydrogen bonds. Okay, so between the thiamine and adenine, it is two hydrogen bonds. And then if we can just look for um, the parts where cytosine is bonding with guanine, you just move with me here, just follow the cursor there, that structure there or this nitrogen base is guanine. And then here we have our cytosine. And again, if you have very sharp eyes, then you will see that there are three lines between cytosine and guanine, and those represent the three weak hydrogen bonds that bind together the cytosine as well as the guanine. All right, so that is run about it. So guys, do not worry about not seeing um, clearly or not seeing my structure clearly. In all exams and tests, they will give you clear pictures. All right. Okay, so here we have a clearer picture of the hydrogen bonds. Remember we said that DNA is a double-stranded molecule and it is made up of monomers of nucleotides. And we can see here we have a repetition of um, our of our nucleotides. Uh, let me just do this quickly. Okay, beautiful. So we have our phosphate group there. We have our sugar there, which is our deoxyribose sugar. So the phosphate is connected to the sugar. The sugar is connected to the nitrogenous base. Then the nitrogenous base is connected via weak hydrogen bonds to the other strand of DNA. But if we just first look at this first strand, this side, the ACT strand, we can see that the phosphate is connected to the sugar, connected to the nitrogen base. But the sugar of the first nucleotide is connected to the phosphate of the second nucleotide. Okay, so we have a sugar phosphate bond right there, which is connecting nucleotides of the same strand, okay, or of the same polynucleotide. All right, and then here we also have our cytosine bonding to our guanine, and we have those three weak um, gain. You should be able to tell, or rather, you should be able to see that if these are complementary base pairs that are going on, and we see the sugar phosphate backbone as well. And here is the final structure where it twists into a double helix, and the twisting usually happens around proteins which are called histones. Okay. Now let's move on to genes and non-coding DNA. So each DNA is made up of many small portions. Then one type of the portion of DNA that carries the code for a certain characteristic or trait, then these portions of DNA also carry the code for the formation of a protein. So these small portions of DNA are what we call genes. Okay, then the other portion of the DNA strands do not carry any codes at all. And we would refer to those portions of DNA as non-coding DNA. And here we just have a summary where we would look at the coding DNA, the codons and non-coding DNA. We'll look at the definition as well as the function. Okay, so firstly, genes or coding DNA, the definition is the section of DNA that codes for a particular protein, trait, or characteristic, all right? And then the function of coding DNA is that a gene is switched on in the cells where the protein is needed 
the gene may be inactive in cells where a particular protein is not needed. So if a particular protein is needed, then that part of the gene will code and would say that the gene is switched on. All right, then codons, which we are going to look closely um, when we deal with RNA, um, but you guys can just also now have the definition in the back of your mind. Definition of a codon is that they act as a full stop and some actually act as a starting point. And the function of codon, it shows the end of the information about a protein. Then we can just jump on to non-coding DNA, which is also referred to as junk DNA. So it's sections of short repeated sequences. So those are the STRs of DNA is that it does not code for a protein. And STR just stands for short tendon repeats. Okay, so these are just sections of your DNA which do not code for particular proteins, right? So we won't have a formation of a protein with regards to that code, okay? So the function, it indicates the start of the gene, regulates when and where genes are expressed, useful in determining an individual's identity as the STRs are highly variable, right? So that means we have a lot of STRs. Okay, then discovery of the structure of DNA. So we have <laughs> Rosalind Franklin and Maurice Wilkins. So guys, you don't need to know the first names, just um, know the last names of the people. For example, with regards to Rosalind Franklin, would say that it is Franklin and Wilkins. Okay, so instead of saying Rosalind Franklin and Maurice Wilkins, we'll just talk about Franklin and Wilkins. So they used X-ray crystallography in producing the first images that suggest the shape of DNA. Then in 1953, James, James, sorry, James Watson and Francis Creek reported the discovery of the structure of DNA in a magazine. Then they were awarded a Nobel Prize for their work. And there were certain discoveries that were also made or their conclusions rather during their discovery of the DNA. So one of those is that they concluded that DNA is made up of similar amounts of C and G. So remember our C would be the cytosine and G would be the guanine. So these are the nitrogenous bases. And we also have similar amounts of A and T. And A is the adenine, nitrogenous base called adenine. And then T is the nitrogenous base called um, thymine. All right, so this is just one of the most important discoveries that they made during um, their search. All right. So another um, important thing is that by making this discovery, it led them to the idea of complementary base pairs which led to the idea that the DNA can make exact copies of itself. Right. So here we have a picture of the X-ray diffraction of DNA, which was um, a picture taken by Rosalind Franklin. All right. Okay, then we have another question. As DNA was extracted from cells of E. coli, it was analyzed for nitrogen base composition. It was found that 38% of the bases were cytosine. What percentage of the bases is adenine? And our options is A, 12, B, 24, C, 38, and D, 62. Okay, so guys, to answer this question, we should use our knowledge or previous knowledge from um, what we learned from the discovery of DNA. So I'll just go back a slide. There we go. So we can see here on the last bullet, it says that Watson and Crick concluded that DNA is made up of similar amounts of cytosine and guanine and similar amounts of adenine and thymine. Right? So meaning that 
if we're talking about similar amounts, you're saying that C is basically the amount of C would be equals to the amount of G and the amount of A that we have in a DNA molecule would be equals to the amount of T, which is thymine, right? So here we have 38% with cytosine, meaning that 38% of the composition of DNA, the other 38% rather, would be guanine because cytosine always pairs with guanine and then would be left with, let me just get here. So 38% is cytosine, and then 38% would be guanine. Therefore, 100 minus 76 will give us 24, and we're left with 24%. If we half 24% between A and T, then we are left with 12. So that is why the answer is 12, because we have 12% of adenine, and the other 12% will be thymine, and that will give us a whole number, which is 100. Right, so the answer to this question here is 12. So there was a bit of mathematics here. So guys, just make sure also that um, you have like the right mathematical skills when you get to your paper. So you will have calculations, right? You will have calculations during your trial exam and your final exam to so just prepare accordingly. Okay. Then we move on to functions of DNA. So functions of nuclear DNA, firstly, it stores all hereditary information in the form of a code of nitrogenous bases. Then it controls the synthesis of proteins and it transmits hereditary characteristics. Profiling. So we just in A. Okay. So let's see here. Yeah. So this is basically DNA profiling, where we usually say that in DNA profiling, or rather DNA profiling, if we were to define it, right, would say that this is where a sample or other DNA is released or extracted from a particular sample and it is compared with other forms of DNA. And the steps to that are as follows. So we would have a cell sample there, then DNA is extracted from that sample. I believe um, most of us had the opportunity to actually extract DNA from a fruit or a vegetable while we were still in class. Right, so then we'd have cleavage of the DNA by restriction enzymes. Then separation of DNA fragments will happen via the process called electrophoresis. Then um, after that, it is transferred to a membrane using saturn blocks, which is also a biochemical process which is used. Then we bind the radioactive DNA um, probes to specific fragments. Then the membrane is washed free of excess probes, then an X-ray film is used to detect the radioactive pattern, which gives us this DNA comparison here. So we'd usually have one from our sample and would have one from our first plant and another sample from our plant B as indicated here, and then would compare and basically get to a conclusion. So that would also depend as to why we did the DNA profile, all right? So DNA profiling, guys, it's also called DNA fingerprinting or fingerprints, all right? Okay. Oh, just another thing, guys. Um, you do not need to know these various steps just to basically understand how it happens, all right? So these steps, which I have mentioned right now, they are not for exam purposes but for just a background and understanding um, DNA profiling, okay? All right, so then uses of DNA profiling, we find that DNA profiling is used in diagnosis. Okay, so what do we mean when we talk about DNA profiling 
being used in diagnosis. That simply means that a DNA profile can be used to diagnose inherited diseases like your cystic fibrosis, hemophilia, sickle cell anemia, um, right? And I believe those are one of the sicknesses that we deal with when we look at genetics, okay? So diseases may be diagnosed in newborns and unborn children, and any detection of the inherited diseases are important, okay? So it, because it helps parents as well as medical staff to prepare themselves for proper treatment of the child. Okay, then the next use for DNA profiling is developing cures. And so DNA profiling helps with research of these inherited disorders. So researchers, they can use DNA profiling to find patterns in large groups of people with or without the disorder, and they can get into, um, or rather they can get an understanding, right, in finding the cure for this particular disorder. And then another use for DNA profiling is biological evidence. Right, so forensic science is used to find criminals, right? So it has become one of the most re reliable methods of putting a criminal at the scene of a crime, okay? So if we are using DNA profiling with regards to finding criminals, it only proves that the criminal was present at the crime scene and not necessarily that they created or committed the crime. Okay, then another use, lastly, it is the identification of relatives. Right? So when we use a DNA profile, it can prove um, paternity. Okay? So that would mean determining who the father of the child is. You can trace siblings um, who probably have separated at birth, and we can also identify people who have died and could not be identified conventionally. All right, so these are the four uses of DNA profiling. All right, so which leads us to the next slide or other question, which says this picture, this picture alongside is called A, X-ray diffraction, B, DNA profile, C, DNA fingerprint, or D, a fingerprint. And I believe this picture would remind you of Franklin and Watson, and it would be A, which is X-ray diffraction. Right, then we move on to the replication of DNA. So replication of DNA, this is a process by which DNA makes an exact copy of itself. So guys, just know the definition, right, of um, DNA replication. We say that it is a process where DNA makes an exact copy of itself. Right, so then another question might occur, where and when does DNA replication occur? So DNA replication occurs before cell division begins, right? So this means that it occurs at the start of both mitosis as well as meiosis, and it occurs during interphase. It's so very much important to note, it occurs during interphase and right before cell division. which says the significance of DNA replication. And so DNA replication, it ensures that there's identical copies of chromosomes within the cell. Now where we have the double amount of chromosomes so that it can be shared between two cells during cell division. And this would mean that the nucleus can split into two so that each half has exactly the same number of chromosomes as each other, then DNA replication ensures that identical cells are produced at the end 
of mitosis. So um, this, this third last bullet here, it is a very much important. And then we move on, it says that it also ensures that these cells are identical to the parent cell from which they were formed. And this would usually be important during the process of mitosis because we want identical daughter cells, All right? Then this is possible because they arose from identical copies of the chromosome. All right, so that is basically the significance of DNA replication. Okay, so now let us look at the process that occurs during DNA replication. So firstly, we'd have an original DNA molecule, which is called the parent DNA. Okay, so we'd have an original DNA molecule called the parent DNA, and we can also just refer to the picture here, and that would be our parent DNA, then the DNA molecule will unwind. Okay, so important guys, remember that it twisted. So now it needs to untwist a bit and unwind. Then the weak hydrogen bonds between the nitrogenous bases will break, forming two single strands of DNA. Um, I think you, it can be, or you can see it right here at this part there where we have two single strands because this DNA molecule unwind and the weak hydrogen bond between the nitrogenous bases, they broke down. All right, then we have, or rather, sorry, then the strands will act as a template for the formation of a new strand. All right, and here we can see it much clearly where we would have a template for the new DNA. So these are the um, this was the original or the parent DNA that where we had the hydrogen bonds breaking and then the single strand will form a template for the new DNA molecule and so now the nitrogen free nitrogen bases will attach to each of the single strands there. Okay. Right, and then it continues to say that these nucleotides attach to the complementary bases so that adenine joins thymine and guanine joins cytosine. Okay, so these free nucleotides are found in the nucleoplasm. So remember the nucleoplasm is also where in the nucleus of the cell. All right. Then we have two new DNA molecules which are formed as shown in the diagram here. So we'll have that um, daughter DNA as well as this daughter DNA, right? So just firstly, the daughter DNA would usually refer to this template there or the non-template. Okay, so that would be our daughter DNA. So the new strands are called the daughter strands. And then each strand is identical to each other and to the parent strand. And this entire process is controlled by enzymes. And we also have a main enzyme, which we find during DNA replication. And that enzyme would be called DNA polymerase. Okay, so the only enzyme that you guys need to know for now is DNA polymerase. But if you do go further or further your studies in genetics, then you would find out about your helicases, your ligases. So those are just other enzymes which are involved in DNA replication. All right. So here we also just have a summary of DNA replication. So this was found in the Macmillan textbook. And here we have, if we can just go through it, we are told there that A is a DNA molecule and there we find our DNA polymerase. So that is the enzyme that controls DNA replication. So number one, DNA molecule unwinds. And then number two, we say that the DNA polymerase unzips the DNA molecule by causing the hydrogen bonds to break between the base pairs and this will result in two separate base pairs. Then number three, each single strand of DNA acts as a template. Then number four, three DNA nucleotides in the nucleus pair up with the complementary bases on DNA forming a new hydrogen bonds. 
Then five, when the three DNA nucleotides are lined up, they join together to form a new polynucleotide chain. Right. So guys, you should know the steps of DNA replication. Just be able to um, describe this process of DNA replication in order. Okay, very much important. You should know the process of DNA replication in its order. So you can also just use this summary here, which was found in the Macmillan textbook. So it has um, five steps and you can write these down for yourself in your book or um, in the notes that you make and just read through them and understand them. And if there is anything that you do not understand, remember, always ask for help. Okay, question. A complementary base pair for A is our options. A is G, option B is C, option C is T, and option D is U. Okay, all right, so we are looking at A. The complementary base pair for A is, okay. So now um, we can see that this is a double-stranded molecule, therefore it's a DNA. And we said that adenine always binds with thymine. Okay, and adenine is usually abbreviated with A and thymine is usually abbreviated with T. So therefore our answer would be C. Okay, so our answer is not G because guanine is always um, bound with cytosine and our answer is also not B because cytosine is always bound to guanine and our answer is definitely not D, which is U. Um, U stands for uracil and we'll be looking at uracil when we look at our RNA molecules. Right, so the answer in this case, it is C, which um, C would be T, which is thymine. Okay, and then we have another question. Segments of a chromosome that controls each characteristic is called, is it A, RNA, B, a G, C, DNA profile, or D, DNA fingerprint? So we are talking about a segment of a chromosome which controls each characteristic or a particular characteristic, and that would be, or rather, let's start by eliminating options which are not um, a part of this question, RNA. So it would not be RNA because we know that RNA is a nucleic acid, and in this case, we are talking about a segment of a chromosome, so it's definitely not A. And then is it a DNA profile? Hmm, nope. Is it a DNA fingerprint? So if we are ruling out DNA profile, then we are most definitely also ruling out DNA fingerprint because DNA profile and fingerprint are the same thing. And we are left with option B, which is a gene. Remember genes are our coding DNA. And therefore they would control a particular characteristic, a trait or a formation of protein. Okay, now that brings us to RNA, ribonucleic acid. So this is another type of nucleic acid. We have three types of RNA. The first type is called ribosomal RNA. Then we have what we call the messenger RNA. And we also have our transfer RNA. And just in this picture here, you can see that we have our tRNA there, which is the transfer RNA. And guys, important that the T is not a capital letter, but it's a small letter. Okay, but then the RNA, the R N and A are in capital letters. So same as with the rRNA, which is your ribosomal RNA. The first letter R is in a small letter, then the RNA is capitalized. And also with mRNA, 
the M is a small letter, and then the RNA is capitalized. All right, so these three types of RNAs are located in different parts of the cell. We start off by looking at the ribosomal RNA. This would usually be found in the cytoplasm of the cell. Then we have our messenger RNA, which is found in the nucleus of the cell, but will also be found attached to the ribosome in the cytoplasm. Then we have our transfer RNA, which is found only in the cytoplasm of the cell. So guys, um, it is also important to note the location of these different types of RNA um, molecules. Okay. All right, so we continue with our ribonucleic acid. RNA is also made up of monomers called nucleotides. So just like DNA, which is also made up of monomers called nucleotides, so is RNA. But now what is the difference between RNA and DNA? So now the sugar, the pentose sugar in RNA is ribose. So remember the pentose sugar in DNA was deoxyribose. Okay, and we also have four nitrogen bases. And these nitrogen bases are your cytosine, guanine, adenine, and uracil. And you will see that thymine has been replaced by uracil. Okay, so when we look at an RNA molecule, it does not have thymine. All right, so it is easy to differentiate between a DNA as well as um, RNA molecule, because in DNA, you will find thymine, but in um, RNA, you will not find thymine. Rather, you will find uracil, which is usually um, indicated with the letter U, okay? And another important thing is that RNA is a single-stranded molecule. RNA is a single-stranded molecule, and in, when compared to DNA, DNA is a double-stranded molecule. So you can see here, we only have one strand, and we still have our phosphate connected to our pentose sugar, connected to our nitrogen base, and then the sugar of the first nucleotide connects to the phosphate of the second nucleotide, giving us a sugar phosphate bond between these two nucleotides on this single strand of RNA. Okay. Question. This is found as a constituent of DNA. Is it A, uracil, B, thymine, C, ribose, or D, both A and C? And we would note that um, with what we have already learned so far is that uracil is found in RNA. So uracil would not be our answer in this case. And our answer is definitely not C because ribose is a sugar which is found in our RNA molecule. And it is definitely not D because D um, says that the answer is both A and C, uracil and ribose, which is incorrect. And the correct answer is B which is the nitrogen base thymine. So remember thymine is a pyrimidine. Okay, and it usually binds to adenine in DNA. Then we have a next question. It says the process illustrated occurs in the, is it A, cytoplasm, B, ribosome, C, nucleus, or D, none of the above. So we have molecule one and we have molecule two. Okay, so firstly, we should identify the type of process that is taking place in um, this picture. So we have two molecules and that already tells us that um, there is a definite, definite possibility that the molecule or rather that the molecule we're looking at is DNA because DNA is a double stranded molecule. Right, so now another thing that we need to do is look at the types of bases that we have. So we have A, which is adenine, and it is found in DNA. 
we have G, which is guanine, which is found in DNA and RNA, as well as A, right? Then we have T, which is thymine, but thymine is only found in DNA, but it's not found in RNA, so we can immediately cancel out um, with confidence RNA or, or yeah, we can immediately cancel out the RNA molecule. All right, so the process that could be illustrated here would be DNA replication, All right? And DNA replication occurs where? That is in the nucleus. So DNA replication does not occur in the cytoplasm or, or ribosome, but it occurs in the nucleus. So important to note where DNA replication occurs, that is in the nucleus. All right, then moving along to protein synthesis. So protein synthesis is the process by which proteins are made or manufactured. Then protein molecules are long chains of amino acids bonded together by peptide bonds. Then we have around about 20 different amino acids which are used to make proteins, right? And basically the difference between pro proteins or the differences that we can see between proteins is the sequence and the number of amino acids that are used to make various proteins. So various proteins, they differ in the order of the amino acids. They um, differ as well in the number or the amount of amino acids which are present. Okay, then the process of a protein synthesis takes place in two stages, which are namely transcription as well as translation. Okay, now we are going to look at transcription of mRNA from DNA. Remember, mRNA is the messenger RNA, or messenger ribonucleic acid. Okay, so during transcription, mRNA is made using a section of DNA as a template, right? So meaning that our DNA molecule will unwind and unzip, then an mRNA molecule would form. Okay, so when the cell requires a particular protein, the enzyme RNA polymerase, very much important to note here, the uh, main enzyme that we find in transcription is RNA polymerase. Remember in DNA replication, we looked at DNA polymerase, right? So RNA polymerase breaks the hydrogen bonds between complementary bases in that section of DNA and zipping it so that the two DNA strands move apart. Then the portion of the DNA molecule that carries the code for making a specific protein is called a G, as we have already mentioned. Then each protein results in a particular characteristic, for example, a person's blood group, and it could also be a person's height, etc. Right, so here we have figure 1.15, which shows us transcription of DNA. And this picture was also found in the Macmillan textbook. So that is Solutions for All, Macmillan grade 12 textbook, which you guys can also get for yourselves on Snaplify. It is free of charge. Okay, so let us go through the various steps of transcription, and we will start here at number one. It says we have a DNA molecule which unwinds, okay, and then step two, which is right under number one, right there, the enzyme RNA polymerase unzips the DNA molecule by causing the hydrogen bonds to break between the base pairs the two polypeptide chains would then separate. Okay, and then here we have our enzyme, the RNA polymerase there in pink, right there. And then step three, the coding strand of DNA act, acts as a template. Okay, so DNA will always form or would always be a 
template, right? And then number four, step four, the free RNA nucleotides in the nucleus. So these free RNA nucleotides are usually found in the nucleoplasm of the nucleus, all right? So they would pair with the complementary bases um, in the coding strand of the DNA molecule. The free nucleotides join up to form a new polynucleotide strand, which is called mRNA. So let's say, for example, on the template, we have A, right? Then on the mRNA, we'd have the U. So remember, in RNA, adenine always binds with uracil, right? So in DNA, adenine would bind with thymine. But when we get to RNA, adenine binds with uracil. So if we had a G, then the G would be bound or rather if we had a G on the template strand, then on the mRNA strand, we'd have a cytosine, okay? So, and it will go on up until the messenger RNA is completed or is enough. Okay, then we move on to step five. The two polynucleotide chains of the DNA molecule would rejoin and rewind back into a double helix. Okay, so just after this RNA molecule has formed and has left, then the two polynucleotides of the DNA will rejoin and rewind back into its original form, which is a double helix structure. Then last step, the completed mRNA molecule separates from the DNA molecule and passes out of the nucleus. So that is why we find mRNA in the nucleus as well as the cytoplasm of the cell, all right? So guys, again, also very much important, you should be able to define transcription and you should also be able to describe the process of transcription. So here is a beautiful summary where we have um, six steps of transcription. So you guys can also use these six steps as a summary for um, the description of transcription from DNA. So this would fall under protein synthesis. So remember, protein synthesis occurs in two stages. First stage, we have our transcription. And the second stage, we have our translation. And I believe that's what we are doing now. And yes. We are looking at translation of the mRNA to proteins. Okay. So firstly, the sequence of bases on the mRNA is complementary to the sequence of bases on the DNA coding strand or the template or the DNA template. Okay. So now each group of the three bases on the mRNA is called a codon. So you guys would remember when we're looking at genes as well as non-coding um, DNA, we looked at the definition of a codon, right? Then each codon codes for a particular amino acid in the protein that is going to be made. And I think this is where most of us get confused, but do not confuse yourself, guys. Ne? A codon, remember, a codon would code for a particular amino acid in the protein that is going to be made. That's it. All right. Then these amino acids, which are found in the cytoplasm, are picked up and carried to the mRNA by a tRNA molecule. So that's our other type of RNA molecule. And we'll look at the tRNA molecule, um, tRNA molecules structure on the next slide. Right, so then the first codon on the mRNA is a start codon, and it means start reading the message. Then the last codon would be a stop codon, and that would mean stop reading the message or the protein is complete. Okay, so the length of our stop and start codons will differ from protein to protein, as well as the sequence, okay. Then we move on here, which says translation is the process during which the genetic code of the mRNA is used to determine the sequence of amino acids during 
protein synthesis. Important to note the definition, right? Definitions are very, very, very important. Okay, then our last bullet says the code is read by the ribosome to which the mRNA attaches and leaves the nucleus. So you would remember that this um, would be our last step during transcription. Okay, so here we have the tRNA molecule, which basically with an attached amino acid on it. Okay, so the tRNA molecule will have the amino acid there, and this is our tRNA, and it will have what we call an anticodon. So a codon is found on the mRNA strand, and then an anticodon is found on the tRNA. Okay, codon mRNA, anticodon is found on the tRNA, and usually the codon and anticodon are, have, um, are complementary as well, all right? So they also somewhat complementary. And here we have basically just a summary of translation of RNA to make proteins. Okay, so this summary was also found in the Macmillan textbook, which you guys can also get hold of on Snaplify, just say um, solutions for all, grade 12 life sciences, and it should appear there. All right, so here on this figure, we have our tRNA molecule, we have our anticodon right there, and we have our codon there, and these, the anticodon as well as the codon will match, right? And then our tRNA, remember, it is carrying an amino acid. So once this anticodon binds to the codon on the mRNA strand, what we will have is that the amino acids, they will bind together via peptide bonds. Okay, so remember peptide bonds hold two amino acids together. And when we have various amino acids, they will give us a protein. Okay, so a polypeptide is basically a protein. Okay, then we have our large subunit of ribosome there. So in order guys to, um, if you're given a diagram and the diagram or a diagram like this, and you're asked what process is taking place in this particular diagram, you guys can um, basically see that translation is happening because of the presence of this large subunit of the ribosome. So if in the diagram, you see a ribosome or a structure similar to this one here, which is in yellow, then the process which is indicated by that diagram would definitely be translation, okay? Or if you see amino acids, then we are definitely looking at translation. So we have the large subunit there of the ribosome and the small subunit there. So the ribosome moves along the mRNA. It would move in that direction there, which is from left to right. And again, that is depending on what, um, or rather on the diagram that you have, okay? Right, so here we have the table of amino acids. It says the table 1.1, this is the mRNA codons and they are corresponding amino acids or instructions. So in order to be able to use this um, table, we look here. You first read the first letters here, U, C, A, or G, and these, and then you read of the second letters, right, which is your second base and your third base. And once we have a codon or three of them, there would be a key or a line to a particular amino acid. So what happens here is that our tRNA or our anticodon would have this, these, um, codes here, all right? And then these codes will need to match with the codons or the codes which are found on the mRNA strand, all right? So remember the, sorry, remember the mRNA gives us the code for the amino acid which we need, all right? And our start codon is always methionine, all right? It's AUG, so that would usually indicate, not usually, always, indicate um, the start of protein synthesis or translation. And then our stop codons is UAA, UAG, as well as UGA. And that would indicate that 
the reading of the protein is completed or the manufacturing of the protein is completed. So guys, you do not need to um, know this table off by heart. So that is really not necessary. If you, if you do come up um, with a question, which is asking questions related to translation, and then this table will be provided for you, or you will just be given a short summary of the amino acids as well as the anticodons that you will be using. Okay, so there is really no need to cram this table or the amino acids. Okay, so these will usually be given to you. All right. But what you can know is the AUG, um, which is always our start codon. All right. Okay, so here we have a summary of the stages of protein synthesis. Remember we said that protein synthesis occurs in two phases or two stages. Then the first stage is a transcription. The second stage is translation. All right, so now we're going to look at the what, where, and how of these two processes. So this is also just um, a quick summary that you guys can also use in preparations for your trial exams or in preparations for your um, final examination. All right, so let's start with transcription. Says what? So what is basically asking for a definition? What is transcription? So that is the process which a genetic code from DNA is copied into mRNA. And then where does transcription take place? in the nucleus and then we have a question which says how does transcription take place we have our five steps right there firstly the gene which is a section of dna coding for the protein unwinds then two dna strands separate as hydrogen bonds break then the exposed dna strand acts as a template for the formation of mRNA, that is our messenger RNA. And this is controlled by the enzyme RNA polymerase. Okay, then our third step is that the RNA nucleotides in the nucleoplasm pair with the exposed nucleotides on the DNA strand. And we are also just given a note there that we should remember that uracil replaces thymine in RNA. Okay, so there are no thymine nucleotides present in an mRNA molecule or a tRNA or a rRNA. Right. Then step four, the mRNA strand is formed. Every three bases on an mRNA is what we call a codon. Right, so which codes for a particular amino acid. Then lastly, the mRNA strands separates from the DNA and exits the nucleus through the nuclear pores and DNA would return into its shape, which is a double helix. Right, so the mRNA, as it exits the nucleus, it would be attached to the ribosome, which is found in the cytoplasm of the cell. So that's, that is why we first started with our grade 10 revision of the cell, all right? Then we move on to the next step of protein synthesis or the next stage of protein synthesis, which is translation, all right? So firstly, what is translation? This is the process which a genetic code carried by the mRNA directs the sequence, so when we talk about sequence, we are talking about the order, right, of amino acids using the tRNA. And where does translation take place? It takes place in the ribosome, and the ribosome is found in the cytoplasm, right? And how does translation take place? Well, we have our four steps right here. A, which are indicated by letters, right? So step A, 
is that newly formed mRNA attaches to the ribosome and bases of mRNA are exposed. Then B, the tRNA molecules carrying specific amino acids determined by the anticodons travel to the ribosome to deposit amino acids according to codons on the mRNA. So remember we said that codons match the complementary anticodon. So the anticodon is always found on the tRNA molecule and the codon would be found on the mRNA molecule. So remember tRNA is our transfer RNA and it transfers the amino acid. Okay, and then our mRNA is the messenger RNA. Okay, then step C, codon and anticodon pairing occurs and amino acid is released from the tRNA and will form a peptide bond with subsequent amino acids. tRNA molecule moves back into the cytoplasm to pick up more amino acids. Right, and lastly, step D, ribosomes move along enti the entire mRNA strand to read the codons. Then enzymes link the amino acids together to form a polypeptide chain or a protein, then the protein once made will detach from the ribosome and move to the site where it is needed. Right, so just, um, quick, quick um, note that the enzyme that we talk about mainly in grade 12 is RNA polymerase. Okay, so we don't focus on other enzymes which are found um, during transcription and translation. Our main focus is just knowing that RNA polymerase plays a role in, um, in protein synthesis, and then DNA polymerase plays a role during DNA replication. All right. Then we move on to the next section of our presentation, which is terminology. So up to so far, guys, we have mentioned everything, or rather we have went through everything with regards to DNA, the code of life, right? So very, very, very important in life sciences is our terminology as well as definitions. So you will always get a question which asks about terminology or you are asked to give a term for certain descriptions or you are asked to give a definition. And besides, guys, in order to understand the subject content, you need to know your definitions. So this is very, very important. And for terminologies or definitions, I would suggest that you make mobile notes or flashcards. All right, so here we, we just have an example of how to, sorry, have an example here on how to make these mobile nodes or flashcards. You can use like a typical A4 paper and fold it into eight squares. Then you cut or tear out the squares neatly. All right. So what you do is that on one side of your square or rectangle or whatever shape you manage to get your paper in, on one side you would write the term, right? And then on the other side you would have the description of that term. So as you walk around, maybe going to the kitchen, then you can just grab a few flashcards and read the, the, the term on one side, then try to remind yourself what that term means. And you can just check yourself by flipping the flashcard, right? Or you can even just play a game with your friends during group study with the flashcards. And so we can make studying fun, okay? So this is usually very helpful for um, terminology um, sections or questions, sections of the subject rather, all right. So here are some of the terms that we have gone through so far. So the first one is nucleic acid. That is an organic compound that contains the elements carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and they are found in polynucleotides such as DNA and RNA. Just another thing, um, I spoke about making flashcards or mobile notes, 
but if you do like using color then you can just write your definitions on one side like a glossary that you find at the back of a textbook and you can write a list and just use different colors or highlighters so you can use whatever works for you as an individual you can also make a list like i did or you can use um, mobile notes or flashcards but mobile notes and flashcards are much easier all right they much much easier and even just two minutes before your exam you can just quickly go through them and you know check them in the bin once you're done all right then the next term that we have is a chromosome so this is a thread like molecule of dna made up of many genes then our next term is eukaryotic cell that is a cell that possesses a membrane bound nucleus and membrane bound organelles and remember a prokaryotic cell does not possess a membrane bound nucleus or membrane bound organelles right next term is gene that is a specific part of a strand of dna that codes for a particular characteristic, for example, eye color, or it carries the information to make a particular protein, such as hemoglobin. Then our next term, we have the chromatin network. This is the form in which chromosomes are found in the nucleus of the eukaryotic cell that is not dividing. All right, so remember a chromatin network during cell division would condense to form chromosomes. And so the chromatin network consists of a mass of long tangled threads of DNA, which will condense when the cell is about to divide and it will form chromosomes. Okay, then we have extra nuclear DNA. So this is DNA that is found outside of the nucleus and an example of extra nuclear DNA is our mitochondrial DNA as well as our chloroplastic DNA. Then we have um, complementary bases. These are your nucleotide bases, adenine binding with thymine, guanine binding with tartosin, that are able to be joined by hydrogen bonds and therefore hold the double stranded method together. Right? Then the double helix, this is the structure that is formed when two strands are twisted around a central axis, for example, the two polynucleotide strands in a DNA molecule, and the central DNA molecule would be our histone proteins, right? Then we have non-coding DNA, that is DNA that does not code for the production of proteins. Then DNA sequencing, is the process that is used to work out the base sequence of a segment of DNA, which we would find DNA sequencing mostly in our DNA profiling or DNA fingerprinting, right? And then evidence, this is information that is used to test whether something might be true. Again, evidence would be in relation to the DNA profiling or fingerprinting. Then we have DNA profiling, this is the procedure used to identify individual organisms based on the unique sequence of the nucleotide in each person's DNA. Then we have forensic. This is used in the court of law and or with regard to solving a crime. Then cell cycle, the series of events that occur in the cell from the time it is produced to the time it is divided into two new identical cells. So these two new identical cells, we refer to them as daughter cells. Then an enzyme is a specialized protein that speeds up chemical reactions that occur inside or outside cells. So each type of enzyme is specific to a particular type of reaction. For example, DNA polymerase will speed up only the reaction that results in DNA replication, and RNA polymerase would um, speed up the reaction which results in protein synthesis, which would be our transcription as well as translation. 
Okay, so we have quite a lot of terminology that we have covered in this section, and we can act as a pattern for making uh, for the making of a new molecule. So we usually spoke about a DNA template or DNA, which acts as a template for um, DNA replication, and it also acts as a template where the mRNA would also form. Okay. Then mitosis, so this is the type of cell division that occurs in a cell that divides to produce two identical daughter cells. Then DNA replication, this is the process during which DNA makes identical copies of itself under the control of the enzyme DNA polymerase. Then semi-conservative replication. This is when each new DNA molecule forms. So just be similar to our daughter, um, daughter DNAs. Okay, and then transcription, this is the production which happens in the nucleus of mRNA using a G, which is a specific segment of DNA as a template. Then we have translation, which is the process during which the genetic information encoded in the mRNA is translated into the sequence of amino acids in a protein. Then we also have RNA polymerase, this is the enzyme that is responsible for making mRNA from a DNA template. Then we also have the non-coding DNA. This is DNA that does not contain a code for making proteins. A codon, that triplets of bases on a piece of mRNA that codes for a particular amino acid. Then anticodon is a triplet of bases on the tRNA that is capable of base pairing with a triplet of complementary nucleotides on codon, which is found on the mRNA strand. All right, so this almost brings us to the end of our terminology for DNA, the code of life. Lastly, peptide bond is a bond that joins two amino acids. Then a polyribosome, is a group of ribosomes associated with a single mRNA during the translation stage of protein synthesis. Now that brings us to the end of our terminology list. And you guys can just put these terms on flashcards, or you can also just make a list for yourself. Right. Now we're moving on to exam questions. So these are just typical exam questions or typical questions that you might find in exams or that you might come across during your prelim or your trial exam. Okay, so sorry about that. This is this first question, which is question one. It was found in the November National um, Senior Certificate Examination of 2017. All right, so we just going to do question 1.5. It says the diagram below represents a process that occurs during protein synthesis. Right. So we look at the diagram immediately. When we look at the diagram, remember we said that when we look at protein synthesis, we are either looking for an mRNA strand and we're also looking for a ribosome. So firstly, we can see the ribosome there. And we know that the mRNA attaches to the ribosome. And we also see our tRNA molecules right there. Because why? They are carrying an amino acid, or they are carrying these square things, which we could say they are amino acids, right? And another thing is that there at the head, they have those three lines right there. And those three lines would usually be our anticodon. Now we can get into um, answering the questions. Another thing, guys, when doing questions, be guided by your mark allocations, okay? So allow the mark allocation to guide you as to how much information is needed when you are answering a particular type of question, All right? 
So the first um, question says, identify the process above. Identify the process above. Remember we spoke about the ribosome that we are seeing, and we said that the ribosomes are usually found when translation is happening, right? And tRNAs are also visible when translation is happening. So guys, when um, a question speaks about identification, it usually means that you should name the essential characteristics or name the essential process. So for question 1.5.1, our answer would be translation and you'd get a mark for that. And then question 1.5.2 says identify organelle A, right? And then B says identify molecule B, and then C says the bond at E. All right, so molecule A, you know that that is the ribosome or the large subunit of the ribosome, and that is the smaller subunit of the ribosome. Then molecule B is our mRNA strand, and then the bond at E is our uh, peptide bond. So remember the bond between two amino acids is called the peptide bond. So there we go, and you would get a mark, one mark for each question. Then question 1.5.3. Give only the letter of the molecule that A carries the amino acid. What is the letter that carries the amino acid? And that would be C, right? So our tRNA carries the amino acid. Then B is copied from DNA. That would be our mRNA, and it is indicated by the letter B, right? And then C is the monomer or building block of a protein indicated by the letter D. All right, so that would give you a sum of seven marks right there. And then we look at, or rather we go on to the next question. So this is also from a past paper and it's question two. So question 2.1 says, the sequence of amino acids in a protein molecule is coded for by DNA and RNA. The table below shows some mRNA codons and the corresponding amino acids. Okay, so for the mRNA codon, if we have A, G, C, then the amino acid would be serine, uh, GAU, the amino acid will be aspartate, and so on until the glutamic acid, which um, the mRNA codon will be GAG, right? So question 2.1.1, again, be guided, allow the mark allocation to guide you in terms of how much information you should give, right? So question 2.1.1 says, according to the table, how many codons code for Phenyl alanine. According to the table, how many codons code for phenyl alanine? So we'd refer back to our table and we see phenyl aniline is there. That's the first one with the mRNA codon of U, UC. And we also see another phenyl alanine right there at the bottom with a triple U um, mRNA codon. So our answer for 2.1.1 would be two and you get a mark for that. Then question 2.1.2, .2, what is the anticodon for glutamic acid? What was the anticodon for glutamic acid B? So glutamic acid is right here, and we have a GAG. So what would bind to a GAG? Okay, what would the anticodon be for GAG? Remember we said in RNA, Cytosine binds to guanine and adenine binds to uracil, right? So that would be our anticodon where we have a C, which will bind to the first G here and would have a U binding to the A and would have another C binding to the G. And that is why our anticodon is C, U, C and you get one mark, right? So everything needs to be correct and in order, right? Then question 2.1.3, 
says a section of mRNA has the following base sequence and is read from the left to right. And then A says you give the DNA base triplet for the last codon of the section of mRNA. So the last section of the mRNA would be the ACC because it is read from left to right. And again, note, read your questions very carefully. They're asking for the DNA base triplet, right? So question two, Point one point three A would be T G G. Why? Because in DNA, adenine binds to thymine, cytosine binds to guanine. So that is why we have our T G G right there. Okay. Then B says give the first amino acid coded by the section of mRNA. Give the first amino acid, which is coded by, the, by this section of mRNA, and that would be aspartate. Okay, so as you can see, GAU, GAU is represented by aspartate in the table up there. Okay, and then we, um, or rather I removed question 2.1.4 because that was in relation to um, the deeper sense of genetics. So today we're just focusing on DNA, the code of life. So yeah, question 2.1.4 was in relation to genetics and inheritance. So now we move on to question 2.1.5, which says name and describe the process occurring in the nucleus, which results in the formation of the mRNA molecule. So what would that process be? The process which occurs in the nucleus and results in the formation of mRNA molecule. It would be the first stage of protein synthesis, which is called transcription, right? So you get a mark, <clears throat> excuse me, for mentioning that the process is transcription and you get um, your other five marks would be for your description. So remember, if you're asked to describe something, it is said that you need to state in words the main points of a structure, process, phenomenon, or investigation, right? So we are stating the main points of um, transcription. And you say, firstly, the double helix of the DNA molecule unwinds, and you will get your other mark. Then when hydrogen bonds break, so you need to mention that hydrogen bonds break, and you get your other mark. The DNA molecule unzips, so we have two DNA strands which are separate. Then one strand is used as a template to form mRNA using the free RNA nucleotides from the nucleoplasm. Then the mRNA is complementary to the DNA. This process is controlled by enzymes. And there are your six marks. So it is five marks for describing the process and one mark for defining the process or naming the process, All right? Now we're moving on to our other question, which is also question two from a different question paper. And question 2.1 reads, when a thief broke into a car, he cut his arm on the broken glass. Scientists extracted DNA from the blood found on the broken glass. They realized this DNA sample Oh, sorry, they analyzed, sorry, they analyzed this DNA sample and compared it to the DNA from three suspects, which are namely P, Q, and R. So we just get here. So this is the DNA profile, which was found from the broken glass. And this is the DNA profile from um, suspect P, the DNA profile from suspect Q, and the DNA profile from suspect R. Then it says the table below shows the results of the analysis of the DNA from each source. And so already we can tell that our questions will be based on the description that we've been given in the question, as well as what we see here. And immediately guys, when once you see um, bands, 
right? These bands, these dark marks are called bands of a DNA profile. We know that we are dealing with the DNA finger um, printing or DNA profiling, right? So question 2.1.1 reads, what do the diagrams above represent? And we know that it's a DNA profile, and that would be one mark. Then question 2.1.2, which, sus <clears throat> which suspect is most likely to be the thief? Okay, so now what we do here, remember we said that what, after we get a DNA profile, we compare them to other profiles that we have. So this is the blood from the broken glass. So we'd compare it to the bands from suspect P, the bands from suspect Q, and the bands from suspect R. Okay, so the ones that have similar bands or like have similar bands at the same position, then that is most likely to be the thief, right? So when you look at the DNA profile from the glass and we look at B, we can see that the second band are on the same level, right? So if they are on the same level, that would mean that their base pairs are usually the same, right? But we see here that it's in the middle. So you guys can use like your ruler to actually just measure them out. So we can see that this last um, band here matches that of P and also the last one matches that of P. But this band here is not present on the blood on the broken glass. Then we go to suspect Q. So with suspect Q, we can see that, okay, suspect Q has one one okay has that one that one that's matching that's matching wow so suspect q has the exact band as or rather the exact dna profile with the blood from the broken glass and that is most likely to be our suspect so we don't even need to move on to suspect r because we have already gotten one which is identical right so question 2.1.2 would be suspect Q, right? And then question 2.1.3 says, give a reason for your answer in question 2.1.2. And obviously our reason would be with regards to the bands. So all the DNA bands match the DNA bands of the blood on the broken glass. And that, that is why we say um, suspect Q is most likely to be the thief. Then question 2.1.4, states two possible disadvantages of using this evidence in the court of law. Okay, so this is two marks. Né? You could get a mark for either saying human error. You could get a mark um, for saying that they could have been framed because that is a possibility. And you could also get a mark to say that only a small amount of DNA was used. So remember guys, DNA profiling only only, only, only says that a person was present at a crime scene, but it does not prove that the person committed the crime. Okay, so it only proves that this particular person was present at the crime scene and not that they committed the crime. All right. So, yes, that is it for question two. And we shall move on to the next question which is question C and it is a long question. So section C is usually or always rather 20 marks and 17 marks is usually for our um, content and then synthesis is usually three marks. Okay. So let us read the question. It says, define and describe the process of DNA replication, stating when it takes place, as well as the significance of this process. Also describe the uses of DNA profiling in everyday life. So we see our key words or key question words, they are define and describe. Okay, so define, we give a clear meaning, and when we describe, we state in words. Remember, um, in terms of essays, no marks will be awarded for answers in tables, flowcharts, or diagrams, right? So we state in words the main points of a structure, process, phenomenon, or investigation. 
And in this case, we are stating in words the main points of the process, which is DNA replication. All right, so just before we get into what we need to write, uh, remember guys that your, your essay, it needs to be well-structured and it needs to demonstrate good insight and understanding of the question. So that is where most of our three marks will come from, okay? So it needs to demonstrate um, good insight and understanding of the question. All right, so we can get into the um, answers. So firstly, DNA replication, we are defining it, right? giving a clear meaning, that it is the process by which DNA makes identical copies of itself. It occurs during interface just before cell division, and it must occur so that DNA is shared amongst daughter cells during cell division so that each daughter cell has the same number of chromosomes or the same number of chromosomes as the original cell. What is important to note, guys, when doing a long question is that write, if you are writing in bullet form, write in full sentences, okay? So I've just separated my essay and made them in bullet form. I know like most of my questions um, are not full sentences. Like for example, the third bullet says, just before cell division, what just before cell division, you know? That was supposed to be in full sentence that it occurs just before cell division, right? So I just separated my um, points to show you guys the marks that would be allocated in terms of this section here, right? So important to note, write in full sentences and it must be coherent, yeah? it must flow must have a proper flow, right? So then the next section, so remember, just quickly, we gave a definition and we also stated the significance of the process. So these first um, five bullets, they stated the definition as well as the significance of the process. Now we are moving on to describing the process, how it takes place or how it follows, right? So the double helix of DNA unwinds and unzips, and you'd get a mark for that. Then as the weak hydrogen bonds break, this is controlled by enzymes. Each original DNA strand is used as a template. The template is used to form a new strand by attaching free nucleotides. Then the template that is formed is called the complementary strand. Adenine binds to thymine cytosine binds with guanine, and the entire process is controlled by enzymes. And the maximum marks for this part of the section is 13 marks. So you need to write down 13 points. Okay, so that is in regards to the definition, the significance, as well as the process. Okay, then the last part of the question which asked what are the everyday uses of DNA of DNA um, profiling? So the uses of DNA profiling you could use it for testing genes, testing for genes. Sorry, that cause a genetic disorder, and we could use it in investigating crimes. Just basically matching certain people with certain crime scenes establishing paternity, that would be testing on who is the father of the baby, then identifying family relations, if maybe siblings were separated at birth, then you can use DNA profiling. Then we also identify organisms from their remains. This is quite um, unconventional, but it is also used and for developing cures for genetic disorders. All right, so this, this would uh, mostly be related to the um, genetic disorders which are inherited, all right? And the maximum number of marks you would get here is four, okay? And that would equal to the 17 marks for content. So important that the other three marks out of the 20 marks would be for your synthesis, right? Is your essay well-structured? Does it show insights and does it show that you understood the question? Right? So if you have minor gaps 
in your answer, then you would get a two out of three. And if you attempt it, but with significant gaps in your answer, then you would get a one. But if you didn't attempt or didn't even write the question, then you would get a zero out of three. And that brings together that 20 marks. Right. Okay, so now I just wrote a few, some questions here that I know they liked to be asked, but I just couldn't get examples of these questions, but they do, they are very um, popular questions with regards to RNA and DNA. And the first question says, list three similarities between RNA and DNA. So firstly, they both have a sugar that alternates with a phosphate, right? So remember, just mention that they have a sugar or a pentose sugar. If you said that, then you would get your mark. And B, both are made up of nitrogen bases, adenine, tyrosine, and guanine. So those three um, nitrogen bases, you find them in both DNA as well as in RNA. And then lastly, both are involved in protein synthesis. So remember, DNA would serve as a template for the mRNA strand to form. So it is also basically involved in protein synthesis. All right, then the next question that we have is tabulating five differences between DNA and RNA. So guys, if you are asked to tabulate, please do draw your table. It is important to draw your table and indicate the answers as direct pairs. Okay, so now the, um, the question is asking for differences between DNA and RNA. So first we would draw our table, then in one column we'd put RNA and the next would put DNA. So here is our table. And we are asked for five differences. So number one, it, DNA only occurs in the nucleus. So now if we're talking about location, then we need to also speak about the location of RNA, that it occurs in the nucleus as well as the cytoplasm. Then number two, we are talking about the structure. DNA is double-stranded, RNA is single-stranded. Three is also about the structure. DNA is coiled to form a double helix shape. RNA is not coiled. Right, and then four is also on the structure, and we say that DNA has long strands, and RNA only has short strands. And then um, the last one, or the fifth one, is that DNA has nitrogenous base thymine, and then RNA does not have thymine, but it has uracil. Okay, so remember your answers need to be direct pairs. And that brings us to the end of our lesson. Remember, guys, you can get um, certain study guides as well as textbooks on Snaplify. So I got the Macmillan, the solutions for all grade 12 Macmillan textbook from Snaplify. And you also find other various textbooks as well as study guides. And you guys can also use the Mind the Gap um, study guide which you can find on the DBE website. All right, so thank you very much for joining me in this lesson. If you do have any questions, just please direct them to the email below, which is stemdigitalschool at africatv.co.za. And all the best with preparations for your trial examinations. Goodbye.